All of you, so thank you as well. Tonight, I have a distinct honor of presenting the pioneering Biomedical Research Award to Dr. Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health. Now we know Dr. Collins. Dr. Francis Collins' name is synonymous with the Human Genome Project, for which he's been recognized many times. But he's done much more than that. Before he did that, he actually was credited with the development of one of the tools called chromosome jumping for you scientists in the room that was critical for sequencing large amounts of genetic information and for positional cloning that allows the identification of specific genes that are responsible for diseases, diseases including Huntington's disease, neurofibromatosis, and progeria, work that continues in his lab at NIH today. He's a physician, a basic scientist, and a published author, not only of scientific articles, but of books. His work on genetics is not only on the basic science, but also focuses on the ethical and the legal issues that result from our ability to identify the specific genetics of a given individual, a challenging area. Again, he's been recognized by many for this work. And if you're someone who watches late night television or does searches on the internet, he's also a great conversationalist as shown in his multiple, multiple interactions with none other than Stephen Colbert. And if you haven't gone online, seriously, you need to go online, search for Dr. Francis Collins and Stephen Colbert. It's an eye opener. <laughs> These lively discussions also show that Dr. Collins can educate the public on the complexity of the scientific work in which he engages. But this evening, Dr. Francis Collins is being recognized by SWHR for something even closer to our hearts. As you heard in the, in the film, in May of last year, Dr. Collins and Dr. Janine Clayton, director of the Office of Research on Women's Health, co-authored a commentary in the scientific journal Nature, in which they announced that the NIH would be requiring applicants to report their plans to balance males and females, their cells and animals, in preclinical studies. This new policy, once implemented, will be a major step for personalized medicine. Science tells us that biological sex differences are present at every level in the body and persist throughout the entire life of an individual. Ensuring that biological sex is a fundamental variable in research will ultimately revolutionize the way that biomedical research is conducted in the US. And as you've heard, when things influence in the US, they influence around the world. As someone who's had the opportunity to review a large number of studies, both animal and human, that have been conducted to support the approval of both drugs and medical devices in the United States, data sets that have most often not provided sufficient information on gender difference, on biological sex differences, either their impact on safety or their impact on efficacy. I am particularly happy to be standing here this evening. So it is with great enthusiasm and with great thanks that I present the SWHR Pioneering Biomedical Research Award to Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins. Susan, thank you for really a remarkable introduction. <laughs> and it's wonderful to be here this evening. And I must say right up front that I accept this really on behalf of the remarkable team of scientists at NIH who have labored all these many years uh, to try to understand 
how it is that life works and how disease occurs, and who increasingly, I think, share with me the sense that sex is a critical biological variable and we should be including it in everything that we do. And so it's, well, thank you. And I gotta say, from my observation, about 20% of you have actually started to enjoy your appetizer or salad or whatever it is, and 80% have not, and you should go ahead. Because <laughs> sometimes I find I can't speak without the clatter of flatware, so <laughs> please just proceed. Susan, that was indeed a wonderful introduction. Phyllis, your leadership of this society. Florence, uh, your brilliance in figuring out the need for this and stimulating many others to join that vision is something we can all celebrate here a quarter of a century later. I, in fact, thinking about this evening, recognize my own connection because who was it who recruited me to the National Institutes of Health 22 years ago? It was Bernadine Healy. And we should mention Bernadine, should we not? Yes. Her vision in many ways, uh, which caused me to give up a safe and stable academic career at the University of Michigan and become, oh my God, a federal employee, <laughs> was just one example of the vision she had for where medical research needs to go. And of course, the way in which she has influenced the things we're here to celebrate tonight over 25 years needs to be mentioned. And I also have to mention another person who had a profound influence on me after I arrived at NIH and who we should recognize tonight, although she has now left us, and that is Ruth Kirstein. Yeah, let's clap for Ruth. Ruth, who is the first uh, director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, was also a profound leader in understanding and implementing many of the things that many people take for granted about the idea that women's health is not just off there in the side somewhere. This is the center of what NIH is all about. So today is a special occasion. I understand that Congresswoman Lowy has arrived. I don't know if other members of Congress have as well. Hello there. Wonderful to be in your presence. What a remarkable leader uh, you have been uh, for medical research, for women's health, for so many things that our country cares about. It's an honor to speak in front of you. And there may be other members who are appearing if that vote finally get done, whatever it was that you were voting on, I hope it was really important. <laughs> I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. <clears throat> but first, <laughs> today is an occasion to celebrate. Before I start complaining, uh, so today, a celebration of 25 years of hard work. We've made enormous strides. The Women's Health Initiative, born at the same time that the Society for Women's Health Research and NIH's Office of Research on Women's Health uh, came about, has yielded up an enormous uh, trove of information about how we can best do disease prevention and management of illness in women. A recent analysis, just a dramatic result here, said that from the Women's Health Initiative, we've added 145,000 quality adjusted life years. That sounds a little economic, but what does that mean? 75,000 women have been spared from heart disease and 126,000 from getting breast cancer because of the Women's Health Initiative. And for all those bean counters out there who are like, you know, medical advances are okay, but what has that done for us economically? Well, let me point out <laughs> that that same analysis says the Women's Health Initiative resulted in a 140-fold economic return on the initial research investment over just the first decade. So there you go. But since then, of course, we've expanded our efforts in women's health in many directions. 
Certainly in the area of infectious disease, reducing mother to child transmission of HIV almost to zero when ad adequate access to antiretrovirals is available. <laughs> Controlling the cervical cancer with an HPV vaccine and understanding how health increasingly differs between women and men across many diseases. But I'd be the first to say we're not done. We are a long way from done. I was glad to hear in the video some of the things that Phyllis talked about in terms of the next steps that we need to pay attention to. I'm glad to hear there is this focus now on cardiovascular disease and how women's presentation of heart disease is different than men, and we're not going to understand that without paying attention to that. But this gala is also an opportunity to renew our commitment to understand how sex as a biological variable affects many aspects of what we do at NIH, not just in clinical trials, but also in things that we need to learn more about in terms of preclinical research. And as you heard uh, in the introduction, and as I would like also to give credit to, through the last year, uh, Janine Clayton, who's here this evening, somewhere over here, I gather, right there, <laughs> who was very effective in convincing me that the time was right for NIH to really take responsibility here, not just to be sort of vaguely approving, but actually to be requiring that those who are doing animal and cell studies need to, in fact, be sure that our studies include analysis of males and females and a separate interpretation of what the data means. And I can't help but say that this is built upon a foundation that this society had been arguing for over many years and much credit to SWHR for in fact making that case and to Phyllis and the many others who have put that forward over the years and we have now listened. And I also have to say, because we haven't mentioned her name yet, much credit should be given to the original founder of the Office of Research on Women's Health, who's sitting right over here, Dr. Vivian Penn. Well, I want to promise you, as long as I'm NIH director, which as far as I can tell is about 22 months, uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we will, in fact, be focusing intensely on these issues. You've heard about the BRAIN initiative. It was great to see in that video the focus on the BRAIN. And I can assure you, especially with my deputy director for science outreach and policy, Dr. Kathy Hudson, who's in the middle of all these things, we will make sure we're not just looking at brains from guys, okay? And we're really going to understand uh, the biological implications of sex differences and all that that means. That difference between those boxes and that, you know, ball of wiring, we're going to figure that out. And I, for one, am going to be fascinated by the outcome. And this Precision Medicine Initiative, announced by the President of the United States on January 30th, you all watched that, right? What a phenomenal opportunity to consider the idea that we might bring together a cohort of one million or more Americans, males and females, to try to really understand how do we predict health, how do we deal with risks of illness, how do we manage chronic disease in a large-scale systematic way. And I'm really pleased to see the immediate support of the Society for Women's Health Research in this Precision Medicine Initiative because we got a ways to go here to design this, to see how to get it going, to be sure we have the support of the Congress and the whole country to make that happen. You're going to be a critical partner for us in this, and we will not forget the importance of moving this forward in a way that understands sex differences. I promise you that. So finally, I just want to say, for me as the NIH director, this is a remarkable time. The advances in science that are possible right now are truly breathtaking. I write a blog every Tuesday and every Thursday, and I have a hard time figuring out of the vast landscape of advances that are happening right now, which two things each week am I going to write about because there's so many opportunities. And that is the good part. But I also got to tell you that this is a very difficult time for biomedical research. Many of you know that. We have seen over the last 12 years 
a gradual deterioration in the support for NIH, now amounting to almost 25% of our purchasing power for research. All of the dreams that you have and that I have are actually put at risk because of our inability to come up with the funds to support that. I think we all need to be ready to speak effectively about why this is so important, why this is such a contribution to human health and, frankly, to the economy as well. But we are in a defining moment. I was heartened recently to see in a meeting that was organized by Stand Up to Cancer statements of strong support from members of the Congress about how we really need to turn this around and this deterioration over 12 years needs to tip the balance and move back up into a stable trajectory. But that very same day, we had representations of what the budget for the so-called non-defense discretionary part of what the U.S. Uh, Congress is able to support, and NIH is, of course, part of that. I don't want to say anything specifically about what those predictions were from the budget resolutions, but hmm, <laughs> if you saw that and you wondered, where are we going here? Other countries rocketing forward in biomedical research while we gradually slip into the background? Is that really America? Is that what we wanted? Is that our dream? Is that what we're ready, ready to settle for? Well, I'm an optimist, and I have the sense that Winston Churchill was right about many things, but never more so than when he talked about the Americans. What he said about the Americans was, you could always count on the Americans to do the right thing once they've exhausted all the other options. <laughs> I think we're there when it comes to the trajectory that we're on. If you believe, as I do, that our future depends critically upon research that will uncover the causes of illness and figure out what to do about it, then we're all in this together. I hope you will share my dream, my optimism, and my determination uh, to try to see us get back on a path towards a healthier support of something that affects all of us, uh, namely medical research to uncover the causes of those diseases that afflict far too many people and cause too much suffering and for which we now have the opportunities to make great strides. So thank you for this wonderful award. Thank you for all of you for being here this evening. Hooray for the society, 25 years.